All right. Uh, well, it's almost time. And um, as always, I'll start by doing a brief introduction. So as you guys know, my name is Yulia Spirov. I'm originally from Novosibirsk. I was born there, lived there for most of my life. Um, I lived in a bunch of other countries, including England, New Zealand, Turkey, where I spent three years teaching English at the university. Now I live in Seattle in the U.S. Um, on the West Coast. This, this region is actually co called Pacific Northwest or PNW. Really beautiful place. Um, funny story. <laughs> Last week we had some snow which is very unusual for this region, at least for Seattle, because we're on the coast. And so that really prevents us from having um, very cold weather. And so everything stopped. And the thing is that, um, you know, first of all, everybody doesn't, nobody has winter tires. Everybody has normal summer tires for their cars. Um, also, there isn't enough equipment to clean the snow. And also there are a lot of hills, Seattle and surrounding uh, towns are very hilly and because it's so warm during the day even when it snows it melts very quickly and everything is covered in ice and so that is disastrous circumstances so for about a week you know the schools weren't working lots of people weren't driving also a lot of buses weren't working so it was very hard to get to work for me not just as a Russian, but also as a Siberian. Of course, it was kind of funny to see all of that, but I realize also that, you know, it's very unusual for this um, region, you know, to have so much snow. So I understand, and it's not safe to drive, so. But anyway, this is just a funny story about where I live. Now the snow's melted, it's raining again, which is great. You know, normally people complain about the rain, uh, but because because the rain came and it melted all of the snow, everybody's like, yay, rain. So it's very rare when, when here in Seattle we're celebrating rain. But anyway, hi, Larissa. Thank you for joining us. Okay, so we're about, um, we're, I think we're ready to start. And today I wanted to talk about vocabulary, both learning vocabulary and also teaching vocabulary. And can you guys suggest some ideas? Why is learning vocabulary so important? Again, if you just want to write a sh shoot a quick answer into the chat, why is it important to learn vocabulary as a language learner? Yes, somebody's writing. Okay, I know it's kind of hard, and when I'm teaching these seminars in, in person, it's much easier, you know, to have the audience shout out. I realize, you know, having a webinar, it's not, um, it's not ideal because it takes some time for you to, like, write it and then send it to the chat. But I still want to hear from you because, you know, you guys are teaching and, um, you know, uh, I want to hear your ideas. to express ideas. Absolutely. I mean, words are building blocks of communication and it's easy to communicate meaning with the vocabulary. I mean, you can't really get very far, right, to be able to express your ideas and thoughts. But yes, absolutely. When you think of somebody being a beginner, by having a few vocabulary items, they can already like ask for food. They can already say, you know, what they need or say what they like or don't like so they can be like hot or cold you know you've already well you've already communicated to important needs um also the other side of communication like you you're saying to be able to express your ideas and thoughts absolutely the other side of the coin is comprehension so you know the more vocab the more words the more expressions you know the more you'll be able to understand and finally, vocabulary is actually really important for fluence, for fluency. Those of you who attended my fluency webinar, we talked about how one thing that stops um, interpreters from being fluent is um, not knowing, you know, forgetting words. 
Right. Without grammar, very little can be conveyed. Without vocabulary, nothing can be conveyed. Absolutely, yes, I agree 100%. And um, so, yeah, definitely um, you have to have vocabulary to communicate. You have to have vocabulary to be fluent. And so um, that's why I wanted to talk about vocabulary today. So today we'll talk about how we learn words. And then uh, the biggest part of the webinar will be practical ideas on presenting vocabulary and then on putting vocabulary to work. That is, in other words, practicing vocabulary. And at the very beginning, I asked you, what does knowing a word involve? And somebody said MPF, um, meaning form pronunciation. And you're actually, you know, you covered most of it. And so, you know, when we think about knowing a word, there are so many words we need. There are so many things we need to know. First of all, we need to know a form, both written and spoken, meaning we need to know how to spell it, but also how to say it. We need to know the word's meaning. And meaning, it's not just, you know, the basic meaning. We also want to know the word's register, whether it's formal, informal, or neutral. Um, we need to know its connotation, whether it's positive or negative. Like when we think about words like fat and overweight, right? Exact same meaning, whereas fat has a bit of a negative connotation. We also want to know uh, the word's grammatical behavior. We want to know whether it's a noun, um, if it's a noun, if it's countable. Um, we want to know if it's a verb or maybe a phrasal verb. If it's a phrasal verb, is it separable? Um, is it, uh, we also want to know what words collocate with it or like words that you can uh, use together. And we might also want to know the frequency of these words, you know, uh, appropriacy. Absolutely. Yes. So, so many, uh, so many things to know before we know, a we, before we can say that we know a word. So it's no wonder that we can't always remember, we can't always think of a word when we want to use it. And that's when we talk about receptive and productive knowledge. We also, you know, people also say active and passive vocabulary. And so because... Um, because we have, um, typically, which one is bigger, active or passive, receptive or productive knowledge? If nobody writes anything within, <laughs> okay, I see somebody is writing. Um, receptive, absolutely. Receptive is always bigger. And why is that? Because when you see a word um, in context, all you have to do is figure out the meaning of the word. You don't have to understand every single thing. You don't have to know the connotation. You don't have to know the pronunciation. You see this word in reading in context and you kind of know what it means. And that is enough for now. Now, the second time you see it, you know, you might learn more and you might gradually learn more and more about this word. But basically, if you think about children, very young children, they cannot speak, they cannot write, but they can understand what is being said to them, right? And so if somebody says to a child, can you please give me your toy? They can hear it, they can understand it, they can actually respond to this instruction and they can give you their toy. But it'll be a while before a child can actually say themselves this whole sentence, right? Can you please give me your toy? And so similarly, with us, with language learners, um, there is, um, you know, before we actually use a word, we have to see it a lot of times, right? And so um, knowing a word involves, we just looked at all of these things, um, and that's why you get all of these layers, Every time you see a word, you learn a new thing. You learn, you know, maybe you notice that, okay, it's a noun. Oh, it's uncountable. You can't use it with a, but you can use it with that. You know, personally, I read a lot. A lot of my English comes from reading. And so quite often I know words that my husband doesn't know. And my husband is a native speaker. He's American. However, what I have trouble with sometimes is pronouncing these words. I'll never forget, you know, I was talking to my girlfriends. They were both American and I said, hey, you know, we need like a girl's night out. Why don't we go to a swanky restaurant? And they were like, 
what restaurant? And I was like, you know, a swanky restaurant, like an expensive and fancy restaurant. And they were like, we don't know what you're talking about. And then I spelled it for them. And the word was swanky, S-W-A-N-K-Y. And so I was, I was so embarrassed. And they were, you know, they were nice about it. And, uh, but I was just like, you know, I learned this word from a book um, or from multiple books. You know, I've seen it so many times. I've never heard anybody say it or, you know, I didn't pay attention um, and I've never said it. And so that's why I also saw like one of these internet memes that said, don't laugh at people um, who mispronounce words because they probably learned these words by reading. So there you go. Um, that's why we we have a larger receptive vocabulary than productive, because before you can actually use a word, you have to know so much about each word to be able to use it confidently and appropriately. Um, and so what does it mean for us, both as teachers and as language learners? Um, it means that there are some principles involved in learning words that can help us. So the first principle is repetition. And that's obvious, right? Repetition is the mother of all learning. But simply repeating an item doesn't have a lot of effect on the long-term memory. So you can just be like, swanky, swanky, swanky. You know, these aren't, you know, when you're doing like a working out at the gym and you can do the same exercise over and over again, and that kind of strengthens your muscle. It doesn't quite work like that with vocabulary. Um, you know, um, the you have to have this repetition over spaced intervals. The words... And another thing is that words have to be in the context. Words stand a better chance of being remembered, remembered when it's encountered in reading. And actually it's been estimated that a word has to be encountered at least seven times um, over spaced intervals in order to be remembered. And so basically what it means for us as teachers is presenting opportunities for students to encounter the same word or words or phrases um, over space intervals in context over and over again. Um, another principle, repetition is good for young learners. Yeah, well, it's good for all learners because, yeah, but for young learners, definitely even more important. Okay, um, another um, principle is retrieval, also called retrieval practice effect. And um, that's another kind of repetition, which is important for vocabulary learning. And um, basically, the act of retrieving a word from a memory makes it more likely that the learner will be able to um, recall it again later. And, you know, if you think about it, activities which require retrieval of a word from the memory, they oil the path, so to speak. I also like to um, compare it to, you know, like when you have a grassy area and when you walk through this grassy area, you kind of make a path, right? And so you make this path, but if you never walk there again in time, this path will, the grass will kind of grow back, right? And that's the same thing. If you, you know, you learn a word, you kind of put it in your mind and you never go back to get it, this path, the grass will grow over it. And it'll be that much harder for you to get that word out again. So that's why repeated retrieval and activities which require retrieval of words, um, they improve likelihood of future recall. And later on, we'll look at some activities that practice retrieval. Another uh, principle of uh, vocabulary learning is also pretty obvious, using, use it or lose it. And basically putting words to use preferably in an interesting way, is the best way of ensuring that these vocabulary items are added to our long-term memory. Another principle is cognitive depth. So basically, the more decision a learner makes about a word and the more cognitively demanding these decisions are, the better the word is remembered. What, what decisions am I talking about? Well, these decisions can involve deciding how well you know a word. Uh, it could also 
be matching a word with another word that rhymes like mango, tango, uh, deciding what part of speech it is or what word it collocates with or coming up with an association. And again, we'll talk about some activities that let learners do that. And finally, the, another thing that is important for vocabulary learning is attention. Contrary to popular belief, you can't improve vocabulary by listening to something in your sleep, which is a good thing because otherwise we would all be out of work, right? If everybody could just go to sleep, listen to a tape and then wake up and remember everything. Um, in fact, a degree of conscious attention is required in order to acquire a vocabulary item. In addition, words that trigger a strong emotional response are more easily remembered. Um, you know, if you think about it, we all know some bad words, right? Everybody knows the F word, which I'm not going to say here. But do you actually remember like, I don't know, writing this word down in a notebook? Do you remember like doing exercises with this word? No. You probably heard this word once and you remembered it, right? And sometimes it's so unfortunate, you know, you have some vocabulary that you want your learners to remember and you do this exercises over and over again, you write it on the board, you do some tests and they never remember it. And then you say something like shit once and they remember it forever. And there is nothing you can do to make them forget it. And that is why it's because swear words, they, they, you know, they excite us. They make us feel maybe bad for using them or, you know, they make us feel cool. But the point is, is that they trigger an emotional response. And that's why bad words are always much better remembered than more useful words. So uh, that's another thing that might might be helpful is creating some sort of emotional response or emotional connection between words. Okay, so now that we talked about how we learn words and talked about some principles, what does it mean for us as teachers? Basically, we need to provide opportunities for learners to encounter vocabulary several times and in different contexts. Context is super important. And then we also have to provide opportunities to retrieve and use vocabulary. Now, if you're using a good textbook and key here, keyword here is good textbook, a well-organized textbook, a lot of this is taken care of for you. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but I'm a huge fan of New English File or English File, the third edition. And that's why that that's because, you know, quite often the words that they introduce in one unit, you will then see in another unit. And then they have the workbook, they have, you know, unit tests, they have review. So there are multiple opportunities uh, for learners to encounter the same words and phrases over and over again. But even that might not be enough. And you might want to introduce some other activities, which I'll talk about in just a second. Does anybody, before I move on, does anybody have any questions? Okay. If not, I wanted to talk about uh, presenting vocabulary. And um, two of the key principles that are involved in presenting vocabulary are eliciting and CCQs, or concept checking, extensive and intensive ways of learning words. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. Would, is your question that you would like to learn both ways of learning words? How about this? Um, you know, let's get to the, um, let me go over some activities and this depth. You mean cognitive depth? Um, how about this? I'm going to show some of the activities that I prepared for you. And hopefully they will be, you know, they'll be able to um, to answer your question. And if not, you can always contact me after the webinar. But yeah, um, presenting vocabulary and eliciting. So again, if you're using a textbook, vocabulary pre-teaching might be taken care of for you. So, you know, before students 
read a text. There might be something, you know, there might be some activity where they match keywords to definitions or pictures or something else. But sometimes, you know, it might be necessary to pre-teach some vocabulary for something that you're doing. And so a good way is to elicit this from students. And I remember working with one group back in Russia and my students would get mad at me, you know, because I would show them a picture and I would be like, you know, what is this? And they would be like, we don't know. Why don't you just tell us? Why would you ask us a question that, you know, a question about something that we don't know? We feel stupid. We don't like it. And I told them, hey, listen, you know, if I just tell you, okay, I'm going to teach you some words. Let's write it down. Skirt, yubka, trousers, bruki. That is so boring. I'm actually bored just reading these words to you, right? And so how eliciting works is that it primes your brain by receiving a word. So if I show you something and if I show you this, right? And you might not know how to say it in English, but you might know that in Russian it's called, wait, what do we call this in Russian? Um, подставка, let's say that. Подставка под горячее, или подставка под стакан. So you know what it is. Right, but imagine you don't know what this word is in English. I know you probably know, Larissa. I know most of you probably know, but... If you didn't know what it was, right, and I showed it to you and I was like, hey, guys, what is this? And you would start thinking, okay, это подставка для горячего. Do I know how to say this in English? I do not. But you already have this connection there. And then when I say coaster, boom, you have both pairs. So you're kind of priming, you're preparing yourself for receiving this word. And so how can you elicit? You can start by... You know, you can do it verbally. So you can say, my husband doesn't like working around the house. He lays around on the sofa all the time. He is very, now would be a time for somebody to say lazy. And if you didn't know, you probably thought in your head, lenivy. And then I would say lazy. My husband is very hardworking, not lazy at all. Just an example. Um, you could also do it with pictures or with real-time objects. My favorite way to do it is with uh, PowerPoints and actually with GIFs. And you'll see, oh, oh, this is so unfortunate. If you download the PowerPoint, you'll see that it's a GIF, so it's a moving picture, and it shows this man eating pancakes very well, they're not pancakes, they're kind of dumplings. And then you would also see that in this PowerPoint, so first you don't see the word efficient, you don't see the definition. All you see is this guy eating the pancakes and he's eating them very fast. And so, you know, everybody gets excited, everybody laughs, maybe somebody has already seen this somewhere. And then you say, okay, is he eating fast or slow? He's eating fast. Is he wasting any time? No. Okay, so what do we call? What is, you know, what word can we use to describe somebody who is working well, who is not wasting time or energy? Efficient. And then you show the word efficient. Well, I'm a little bit disappointed that um, it's not working on here, the GIF. Here is just another um, example. I know that... Again, it doesn't look as cool because it's not moving, but if you download the PowerPoint, you'll see. So again, you know, you show this picture and there is a dog and what's happening in the video is that it has this stick and it kind of tries to like, um, it tries to get into the, onto this bridge, it can't, and then it finally figures out how to do it and it gets in. So the word that I'm trying to elicit here is solve. Um, <laughs> this, I also love this. So this is, uh, this picture is used to elicit the expression to change your mind. So clearly somebody bought some green onions, you know, maybe to put in a salad and they wanted to make, you know, a healthy lunch or healthy dinner. And then they got to the checkout, they sold the candy and they were like, nope, I don't think so. And they got the, the M&Ms. So they changed their mind about having a healthy lunch.
Or maybe they just changed their minds about buying onions because the line was too long at the checkout and they were like, nope, I don't need the onions. Um, so these, um, so these are um, some ways to elicit vocabulary. Now, CCQs or concept checking questions are something that are questions that you can use to see if the learners really understand the word or a phrase that you are teaching them. So, you know, if you taught the word briefcase, for example, and you're not 100 sure that, you know, they got it. And so you would say, yeah, there's a whole story behind this. I know behind this picture. Yeah. So, you know, you maybe you show them a briefcase, you elicit the word briefcase, or you show a picture and then concept checking questions. They're usually short yes or no questions. Um, that goes something like this. So do business people have briefcases? Yes. Do people typically put clothes in their briefcases? No. Yes, it's possible to put some clothes in a briefcase, but typically we put our laptops in them. Uh, do students have briefcases? Mm, not really. Mostly students have backpacks. So there you go. Concept checking questions. CELTA is big on them. All right, so now we presented vocabulary. How do we practice vocabulary? How do we, in other words, how do we put words to work? Well, we can, um, we can categorize vocabulary practicing activities into three categories. And now there'll be a lot of activities coming your way. So, um, you can either, you know, take screenshots, take notes, or in the list of files that go with this webinar, there is the PowerPoint that that's what you guys are seeing right now. There is also a PDF document called Teaching Vocabulary Handout. And there are the, it contains all of the ideas that I'm telling you now, but in kind of like one document that's easy to print out. So you can do that as well. Okay, so um, presenting vocabulary is one part of vocabulary and learning. And then all the new knowledge, all of these new vocabulary items, they need to be integrated into learners' existing knowledge or basically the existing network of word associations. We also call this our mental lexicon. And as we just learned, in order for the new words to be successfully integrated into these networks, learners should engage with the words and they should make some decisions about them. In other words, to ensure long-term retention and then recall later on, words need to be put to work. They need to be placed in our working memory and then subjected to a number of operations such as being compared, matched, sorted, etc., to help them move into the long-term memory. And now we'll look at the activities that are meant to do just that. So these activities fall into three broad categories, decision-making tasks, and that's where that cognitive depth comes in. There are production tasks, and then there are some games, fun. So to start off by talking about decision-making tasks, I wanted to give you an example. And um, this will actually require you to try and do, ta uh, do a task. And I know it's, again, with webinars, it's much harder than being there, but bear with me. So in front of you, you see can you see this video on YouTube later? I think so. Olga Mikhailovna. Will it be on YouTube later? Anyway, in front of you, you see some words, multicolored words. Uh, files attached are not available for participants to see. So Yuli, you will have to show it. Um, it's all right. I'm showing you the PowerPoint and most of the stuff that I'm telling you about is in the PowerPoint. The handout is just something that you can easily, you know, have and maybe print out without having all of the pictures and other stuff. 
but no problem. Um, I'll put my email in the chat, and if anybody wants a copy of the handout, feel free to email me and I'll send it to you, okay? But again, by by seeing the PowerPoint, you'll be able to see everything, all of the information anyway, so don't worry about that, that's fine. Okay, so right now in front of you, you see it says word splash, right? And you see some words there. I'm gonna give you a minute and I want you to suggest some categories that you could put these words into. So it doesn't matter how many categories, it doesn't matter what you call them. Um, ideally, I um, I'd like you to put all of the words into categories, but for now, because we don't have that much time, just tell me some categories that you could use to sort these words into. Appearance, okay, we got one, what else? Parts of speech, verbs, nouns, adjectives. Wow, that's a lot of ideas. Clothes, emotions. Okay, I think that covered it all pretty much. Um, some other um, categories that people came up with were men and women, which I loved. It was an all girl, it was a group that had all girls. And so, you know, they, and you can guess, you know, they would be like, selfish, that's man, generous, that's also man, blonde, that's women. <laughs> uh, they also had like positive and negative words. Um, so yeah, this is an example of an activity which requires students to make decisions about words. So obviously in order to, this is a revision activity, this isn't the first time they're seeing these words, but in order for them to be able to put words into these categories, you know, they have to know their meaning, they have to know because some of you said like nouns, adjectives, they have to know what part of speech it is. They also have to know the meaning and connotation because they might try to put them into like positive and negative. Really, there is no right or wrong answer as long as learners are able to uh, justify the choice of their category. So as long as they can say, you know, the the phrase under the weather belongs in the category of men, because, you know, when men are sick, they get much more dramatic than, than women, and they use this phrase a lot. You know, whether or not it's true is arguable, but the important thing is that they're thinking about this phrase, they're processing this phrase, and that's where, you know, that cognitive depth comes in. That's, you know, making decisions about words. And um, activities that require learners to make decisions about uh, vocabulary items, they can be categorized into three categories, matching and identifying, selecting and sorting and ranking. And the activity that we just looked at, which category would you put it in? Would you say it's matching and identifying? Would you say it's selecting? Or would you say it's sorting and ranking? It is number three, it is sorting and ranking, absolutely, yes. And so now I'd like to uh, go over now that I, yes, sorting. Now that I gave you this one example, I'd like to um, suggest some activities from each category. So we'll start with um, the, f oh, these are example categories, that's fine. Um, sorry, just scrolling through. Right, so we'll start with the first category, matching and identifying. And one of the activities I have here is a crossword. And, you know, a lot of students, the, 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 the minute they hear the word crossword, they kind of go, because, you know, <laughs> crosswords can be boring, right? But I personally love crosswords. There is actually this really cool software that allows you to do crosswords. And, um, you know, basically you would select the vocabulary items that you'd like your students to revise. Then you create a crossword using this. Um, I mean, there is loads of options for you. I prefer Eclipse Crossword uh, Maker, it's free. 
and easy to use. And then when you're writing your clues, you can either use ready-made definitions from like Cambridge Dictionary, from the textbook, you can write your own definitions, um, or you can use gapped sentences as long as they, you know, demonstrate the meaning of a, of a word or a phrase well. Um, and then you can either set it as homework, you can do it in class. Um, and if you're doing it in class, you, you'll want to probably pre-teach some of the crossword related words such as down, across, clues, and then you'd want to set some rules like can the students use dictionaries, can they use their notes, can they ask somebody, you know, you could also have them do this in pairs. And, you know, it, it, it could be a very fun activity to do in class if you like set a time limit or if you have students competing with each other. Thank you for that link. Yeah. Um, and then uh, once everybody's done with the cross, and because crosswords are kind of different from just doing an exercise or a test, because once you start solving it, you know, you're really uh, helping yourself find the other words. And then once everybody, if you're doing it in class, uh, once everybody is done, you could check it. And for an extra, um, for an extra challenge, what I like to do is, you know, when you say like, okay, what's one down? Let's say lazy. And what is lazy? And I have them come up with the definition again and, in, and not read it from the clues that, you know, uh, that I wrote, but actually have them say, okay, and what does it mean? And have them define this word again. Um, and then another alternative uh, for a crossword is to create a pair work crossword. And basically it's like gap mode type of activity. So both students have a copy of the same crossword, except that it's partially answered and there are no clues. So each partner has to come up with their own definitions for a word and then they pair up and they help each other finish the crossword. So it goes something like, okay, what's one down? One down, hmm, it's a noun or it's an adjective. It means a person who doesn't like working or doing a lot of things. Oh, it's lazy, correct. So there you go. Um, another activity from the matching and identifying section is, yes, we know crossword, we just did that is definition dictation. I love definition dictation. What you do is you select some vocabulary items that you'd like your student to revise. As you'll see, a lot of my uh, instructions start with this phrase. Select the vocabulary items that you'd like your students to revise. Prepare definitions for uh, a definition for each item. You probably don't want to do more than five or six uh, items. And then explain to your students that you will dictate some definitions to them. And as they listen, they have to write the answer down. So be very clear that they cannot shout out the answer. They can't ask questions. So basically, you know, listen, write the answer down. If you don't know the answer, don't panic and just sit and wait quietly for the next definition. Maybe you'll get lucky next time. And uh, you can read each definition twice. And then once that's done, go over the answers. Again, for an extra challenge, you can have the students provide a definition as they're giving the answer. Another alternative, and especially if it's lower a lower level and you're focusing on spelling as well, it would be to ask a student to come up to the board and then ask, you know, other students like, okay, what was number one? And then have that one volunteer student write it on the board. And if they uh, run into problems with spelling, you can encourage everybody, okay, how do we spell that? Um, and have the rest of the class help them. So this activity, you know, you could do it really very quickly, just like in five minutes, or you could stretch it out by focusing more on definitions and spelling and things like that. Um, a similar activity with matching and identifying also involves definitions. And this is super easy and it requires minimum preparation. 
basically, again, you select some vocabulary items that you'd like your students to revise, and then you write them down or type them up on little pieces of paper, could be three to five items per card. And then you ask students to work in pairs or in small groups. And all they do is that they take turns explaining their items for their partners to guess. And so you could also have them, you know, you could set some rules. You could say, do you want them to use Russian or their other shared first language or not? Um, you know, do you want them um, and, and that they, they can use synonyms, but they can't use words with the same root. And then you could also ask them, OK, if there are any words that you don't know how to explain or you explained it, but your partners can't guess, you know, put like a little star next to it or some other sign. And then at the end of the activity, you could ask students which words or phrases were difficult to explain. And then you could say, you know, somebody could say, oh, you know, I had this word, but nobody could understand what I was uh, trying to explain. And you could ask them to explain it to the whole group and see if other people know it. Or maybe there was a word that nobody remembered. And so you can clear up any residual difficulties. And I love this activity because it requires very little preparation, but it goes a long way. Okay, uh, moving on to the different section and selecting. A cool activity for selecting is choosing an odd word out. If any of you ever used English file, they often have this um, activity in their revise and check section. Um, or you can create your own choose the odd word out exercise. So basically, students have to choose the odd word out in each group. And there is no right or wrong answer as long as students can justify their choice. And you kind of, and I'm saying there is no right or wrong answer. Of course, when you're making this exercise, you kind of have the right answer in mind. But if they're, you know, if they choose something else, it's fine as long as they can justify it. And to make it more challenging, what you could do is after a student makes a choice and then justifies their choice, you could have them add at least one word to the group. So just to give you an example, you know, you see there is a box and it says underline the word, the odd word out. So you have sneeze, cough, headache, sunburn. You know, so you have options. You could, for example, say that sunburn is the odd word out because sneeze, cough, and headache, they're about having a cold or having a flu, and sunburn isn't. Or you could say that, I don't know, like, um, again, sunburn is the odd word out because sneeze, cough, and headache, they're symptoms, but sunburn isn't a symptom. It's just something that happens to you. Or you could say that, what a, I don't even remember when I was writing this, what, what, what was the odd word out that I meant? But yeah, basically, you know, you can definitely play with it and justify it in different ways. Um, another activity from the selecting category is choose three words to describe. Um, Depending on the vocabulary that's being presented, you could ask students to choose three words from the words that you are, you know, uh, using, choose three words to describe themselves. And, you know, these words, they don't necessarily have to be, you know, adjectives of personality. They can be something else. Maybe you're going over the weather and you can be like, you know, if you were, what word would describe you? I would be a hurricane because I cause destruction. You know, sometimes after I use a room for a day, it looks like a hurricane has hit it. There are clothes everywhere. There are socks on the floor. There are books in a pile. So I would, I would say I'm a hurricane. Yeah. Hurricane Yulia. Um, so yeah, choose three items to do, or choose one item or two to describe themselves, to just, to choose their attitude to life, their job, a famous person, the weather in their country and so on. So this could be literal or it could be metaphoric. Moving on to a different category, sorting and ranking. 
and we we looked at word splash together just a few minutes ago but i just wanted to show you the um how you make word splash and first as usual you select the vocabulary items that you'd like your students to revise and then you can just write them down on the board and um, you can write them on a piece of paper in random order and then, you know, copy it or you can get fancy. And if you have access to like a smart board or, you know, a projector or even a printer, um, there is a website that I use to create word clouds. But you can just type into Google like word cloud creator. And then it will, um, you know, all you have to do is type in or copy and paste your word list. And that it'll, it'll give you options for like different colors, the size, the shape, you know, you can have it in the shape of a heart or triangle or whatever. Um, another cool thing about Word Splash is that you can use it as a pre-reading activity. And I know we're kind of going away from vocabulary re revision, but yeah, you can totally use, um, use this to uh, select keywords from the text you're going to read in class and then you show them um, as a word cloud or on a board and then students try to predict what the topic is going to be about and then they try to connect the, uh, the words together to try to make some sentences about the text and then they check their predictions i love word clouds also they look really cool i mean look at that um, all right, so what else do we have in sorting and ranking? A very simple activity where um, you have, and it also works great before a test or like at the end of a unit, um, where you have uh, vocabulary items in a list or, you know, maybe on the board or maybe students get a list. And then you just ask the students to divide the items into three categories. And what they can do is that they can actually write the words in three columns if you have time. Or, you know, if you if you have the words on the cards, that's quite easy to do to move them around. Or they can simply mark the words with a, like a plus, a star and a minus. And the plus would be the words that I know well and I know how to use them. I'm confident um, that I can use them uh, appropriately. Uh, a star would be a word that I'm not sure about. So maybe I kind of know what it means, but I'm not sure. Or um, I know what it means, but I'm not sure how to use it. And then a minus would be words I don't know. And then you could then put students in small groups or pairs and share their lists. And then they would help each other um, explain items that they marked with a star or a minus. And then finally, if they still have questions, then you help them resolve um, any um, remaining questions. So this is a very super, like if, an easy activity. You don't have, to, I mean, you might have to have word lists prepared or you might even work with students, you know, if they have, if they're very organized and you have notebooks, but it's really effective. And that, you know, that's getting them to make decisions about words. Another sorting and ranking activity is putting something into words, um, into order of preference um, or choose a number of the most important items. And that's like whenever you're teaching any kind of like list of lists of words, like school subjects, uh, furniture, objectives of adjectives of personality. You could have after you do all the other stuff, you could have students rank school subjects in the order of their usefulness in real life. Um, or, you know, if you're um, learning furniture and household objects, you, you could say, okay, you're moving to a new apartment. It's totally empty and you only have, you have a limited budget. So you have to prioritize, rank household objects in the order you would buy them. Or, you know, you're talking about holidays and um, things that we use for holidays, you would have students select the five most important items to bring with you on a camping trip. And this could be, you know, something that they do individually and then you do a whole class feedback, or you could make it into an activity which would also help students work on their fluency by having them do it individually, then in pairs, 
then in groups, and then as a whole class. And every time they join with other students, they have to um, they have to combine their lists, right? So first you have, let's say, five items that you wrote down. Then when you meet with another student, they have five items, you have five items, but you can only have five, right? So both of you will have to compromise and so on and so forth. Um, and then another um, cool activity for sorting and ranking involves listening. So let's say the topic is close. Um, the teacher would read a description of several people and the clothes they're wearing, what the students are doing, and this will depend on their lesson. So maybe uh, when they hear, like every time they hear uh, the word t-shirt or a sweater, they have to raise their um, hand. Maybe they get to put the words they hear in the order they hear them. So maybe you have these words like in a word cloud or in a list, but they have to, you know, either write it, like rewrite it or put a number next to them. Maybe there are 10 words, but you will only mention six and they have to tick the words they hear. Or maybe they listen uh, descriptions and then they put the words that they hear from the word bank into three columns, like person one, person two, person three, or even draw. I didn't put this here, but they could even draw the words that they hear. Okay, so basically just to kind of go over what we just talked about, we talked about um, three categories of decision-making tasks, some that involve selecting, some that involve matching and identifying, and some that, some that involve sorting and ranking. And if you want all of this in a simple document, email me and I'll send it to you. Now, um, there, I also wanted to talk about some production tasks and it's perfect timing. Um, so some obvious production tasks involve making sentences with words and making questions. And, you know, these are easy things to do. Um, I'm not even going to really talk about this. So you guys probably all know how to do it and you're all doing it. The two I want to focus on are summarize and story writing. And summarizing, so I just want to show you an example of an activity. I really like uh, uh, the, the news lessons on onestopenglish.com, and they have this news lessons based, based on the Guardian articles. And at the beginning of um, every lesson, they pre-teach some of the key vocabulary. As you can see here, there are some words and definitions. And I'm just showing you because there is already like a ready-made list of vocabulary items, but you could also do this with any text and, you know, you could have your own list of vocabulary items. So after you prestige them, after you read the text, after you answer all of the comprehension questions, what I like to do is to go back to the list of vocabulary and then have students explain how these words were used in the text. So for example, here you have the word arson. So how was it used in the text? Well, the text talked about a man who um, said that his house burned down and he was trying to get insurance, but later the police realized that it was arson, which means he set his house on fire himself. Uh, you could do it either in a, Organ in a more organized manner and have them, you know, okay, these are the words, use these words to summarize the text in the chronological order from beginning to end. Well, you can just do this in random order and look at each word and have students try to remember how this word was used in the text. So have them connect this word to the bigger context. So that's really great for putting words to work. And the last uh, activity I wanted to talk about is story writing. I really love this. So basically what you do is you select some vocabulary items that you like your students to revise. And then you write 
let's say, five words on a piece of paper. You could also get the students to write these words and you could say like, hey, can you remember, you know, one word from the topic of personality, one word from the topic of health, for example, one word from the topic of furniture or just like five random words that you have in your notebook. So um, you have these five words and you want to have, um, you know, if you have like three groups, you need three pieces of paper. And then you find some interesting images and you give your students a list of words and an image and the ha they have to write a story about the image using all of the words on a piece of paper. So here is some example of images you can use. So I, as you can see, they're all from popular movies. You know, we have Friends, the TV show, Problem Child, Number one, I don't remember, um, I think it was Boat Trip. So, and then students have to write a story about this random image using these five random words. And this really gets them thinking about like, oh, like, what does this word mean? You know, how can we use it in a story? And of course it has to make sense, right? And um, after they're done, you could have uh, students present their stories in class. So here is a, an example from a real class of mine. Um, I had students come up to the board and they had to show their picture. Here, luckily, we had like a little uh, computer screen that we could use. And then they showed the words. You can see behind the students, like on the board, they have their words there. So they said, okay, this is our picture. These are the words we had to use. And they then tell their story. And you could have the students all vote for the best story. Or it could be uh, set as homework. So here is an example of um, the um, homework tasks that my students did. So, you know, they had those images and then they wrote stories about them. And it's really cool. Sometimes they actually connect it to the movie or sometimes, you know, the stories are totally random. So this activity is really cool, but you can't use it too often or students get bored. You know, it kind of gets repetitive after a while, but using it once in a while really makes things very interesting. And the whole point is that it's so random that they have to try really hard for the story to make sense. Okay, so it looks like we have four minutes left and I'm slightly running out of time. So I might not be able to tell you about all of the games that I have, but I'll try to get to give you as many as I can. Um, so again, some activities, you know, we talked about some more stru um, structured activities that might even look a little bit like texts for revising vocabulary. And here are some uh, fun ideas. One is Pictionary. And uh, can you tell how to make a link between the context of a textbook and the real life English? Well, this question is kind of bigger than just the vocabulary but it's definitely a good question and you could always try to get students to, to talk about their real life you know like if they're talking about i don't know like furniture you know the most obvious way to link it to their real life is to ask them what furniture they have in their homes or you know, what furniture they would have in their dream home. If you um, watch the ve uh, the webinar about, flu not fluency, I believe dog me. I had some activities about, uh, that talked about like um, drawing. So that would be one. So linking something in their house. So maybe some students don't want to talk about their houses or like they don't have a house yet. And by house, I mean like an apartment or a room or whatever. So you could always talk about a dream house. Um, also not having something, you know, somebody could say like, oh, you know, in this textbook, everybody lives in a house, but we don't live in houses in Russia. We live in apartments. And so comparing 
uh, would also be and saying what you don't have is also a good way to make a link about textbook in real life. So, you know, a lot of textbooks, I often feel like a lot of textbooks are very Eurocentric. So they show like life in Britain or the US. And quite often it's, you know, our lives don't look like that. So maybe pointing out those differences is a good way also to um, to link that. I hope that answers your question, but I wanted to get back to, um, yeah, and again, feel free to email me um, if you have more questions. Um, but uh, going back to one game, and then I'll let you guys go because I'm always over the time, is Pictionary. And Pictionary is a game where, you know, you draw something typically on a board and others guess what you're drawing. It can, in class, it can sometimes be difficult because you kind of have to think on a spot and everybody has to think, you know, it's much harder um, when you have this linguistic challenge as well. And so what I do is I get to st students to work individually and each student gets like one word or two words or phrases that they have to draw. And then they draw it on a piece of paper and I have them put it on the wall. And then we kind of walk around the classroom and look at everybody's uh, drawings and try to guess. So in this picture, a student drew guess. So the word was guess, but it was like natural guess because our topic was like fossil fuel and, you know, environment and natural guess. So her vocabulary item was guess, but this is how she chose to show it. But of course, it was really fun. I mean, guess is not an, a difficult word to remember anyway. But yeah, it was really funny. And I'm sure that, you know, <laughs> they'll remember the word guess for a while. Okay. Um, so it looks like we're out of time. I'm happy to spend a few more minutes uh, and tell you a few more games. Now, if some of you have to go, if you have to run, you're welcome to do that. And I'm going to write my email here. Um, you can email me with questions or to ask me for the handout. And if you have like five more minutes to stick around, I'll tell you more about the games, okay? But if you have to go, no worries, you know, I won't be offended. Okay, so here is Slow Pictionary. That's one game. Um, another game that I like is 20 questions. And 20 questions, if you don't know, is a game where you think of something and then others have to guess what you're thinking of uh, by asking 20 questions. So they say, okay, is it a person? And the questions can only be yes or no. So you can't say like, is it a person or an animal? It has to be, is it a person? Yes. Is it a famous person? Yes. Is it a man? No. And see, I'm counting off questions. When you get to 20, if you haven't guessed, well, you haven't. You lost. And um, another version of 20 questions is using a sticky note and or post-it notes. And here you could either write all of the words yourself. You could have students do it to each other in pairs. You could do all of the students, if you, especially if you have a smaller group, do it to just one student. So there are lots of variations here. And then, you know, I have something on my forehead. I don't know what it is. And obviously also don't let them take selfies because what they do is they say, oh, I'll take a selfie and then they see the answer. So don't let them do that. <laughs> So, yeah, they have to guess what's written on their post-it note by asking questions and saying, am I a person? Am I a vegetable? Am I an animal? And so on. So lots of fun. I love post-it. And, you know, the um, a fun way to do it is to have everybody in the classroom have a post-it note and then having them mingle. It's harder to monitor, so it's harder to make sure nobody cheats. Nobody just tells, you know, each other, like, what do I have here? It says you're a banana. Oh, great, thanks. You know, so, but still, it can be fun if your students are disciplined. Um, another game, nope, I don't have any more uh, pictures. Another game I like is Back to the Board. 
And um, it also works by um, explaining and guessing. So you have a volunteer student that you ask to sit with their back to the board. Just imagine I'm being that student. You write something on, a, on the board, like you see, oh, I know you have to go. I'm sorry. <laughs> I know I'm um, holding you guys up. Almost done. So you see behind me, like there is a little poster that says, I love you. So imagine there, um, like, let's see, I wrote the word fossil fuels. Now me as a student, I can't see that. Everybody who is facing me, the rest of the class can see it. So now the rest of the class has to explain this phrase to me without actually saying it. And you might want to, if your students have never played this game before, you might want to do like a pra uh, practice run and you can be like, okay, let's try. So, and you write something easy like banana. And then if the students aren't participating, you say, come on, like, is it, what is it? Is it a fruit? Is it a noun? Who likes to eat this? And you have students say, oh, it's a noun. It's a fruit. Monkeys like it. The person says banana. Yay. Great. So um, actually, one time I was playing this game with a group of teenagers. They got so excited. The girl who was guessing this phrase, she fell backwards in her chair. I was a little bit worried, but she was okay. But yeah, this game can get pretty exciting, especially if you have like a bigger group of energetic students. They will like really shout out the definitions. And that's also a good way to start a class, especially if you have students that tend to be late. And so this is a good way to spend like first five minutes of a class while you're waiting for latecomers to arrive. And at the same time, you're revising and kind of you're kind of energizing everyone. Another similar, and if you don't have a board, you could always just use like a piece of paper that you hold up behind the volunteer students back. Another similar game is quick write. For this, you'll need a board um, or two pieces of paper that are pinned to the wall, attached to the wall. Uh, you put the students into two groups. Each group nominates a writer, uh, but writers will swap. After every turn, they'll swap. And you uh, read some definitions. So like, let's say the word is lazy and you say, oh, it's a person who doesn't like to work likes to lie on the sofa a lot. And, you know, the first group who writes the word lazy scores a point. Now, you really have to, like, pay attention and make sure you see the, who wrote it first. Um, you also have to uh, be strict about spelling. And so let's say they wrote the word lazy, but they misspelled it. It's hard to misspell the word lazy, so that's probably not a good example, but still. So if they misspell it, they don't get a point, but then another team has a chance. If they write it quickly, they'll get that point instead. So, and then after this word is guessed, they change, um, the, like a new writer comes up to the front of the board. And I think musical bag, I talked about this activity in my fluency webinar, so I won't talk about it again. You can watch it on YouTube. And I think um, with this, I'll conclude my uh, webinar on teaching vocabulary. I hope you got some ideas. I know it was a lot. I tried to fit a lot into one webinar. That's why I ran out of time. Uh, but thank you for watching. Thank you for spending your Wednesday morning with me. For me, it's still Tuesday night. I live in the past. You know, you guys are in the future. I live in the past. It's 10 o'clock in the evening, on Tuesday evening. So, yeah, um, I put my email somewhere there. Feel free to email me with um, questions, um, requests, and so on. And, yeah, I don't know. It's like, I don't know why you guys can't um, download the files, but this is, the, this is what the handout file looks like. I don't know why you can't see it. All right. Yes, thank you, guys for uh, participating. So happy to share my ideas with you and see you next time, I guess in March or in April. Have a great day, everyone.